In this Best Funny Stories of the Month, we bring you our Best Funny Story Compilation of the Month. These funny stories are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes, which we love to generate. Today we bring you 15 funny stories, starting with a story about a beach blooper, until we finish with a hilarious story about a flight attendant. Please watch to the end as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach aches. Ever wondered what you will do if a wave wash your pants from you while in the water? Imagine a beach full of people. What will you do? Let's see how our story unfolds. In today's funny story joke, we dive into the sun-soaked misadventures of Steve, a guy whose beach day turned into an unforgettable escapade. Picture this, a regular afternoon at the beach, where the biggest worry should be sunburn or a sandcastle mishap. But not for Steve. Oh no, Mother Nature had a different kind of prank up her sleeve, one that involved Steve, a pair of missing swim trunks, and a sand bucket with a twist. Buckle up, because this tale is about to take you on a wave of unexpected twists and chuckles. Once upon a sun-drenched afternoon, our hero, Steve, decided to visit the beach. Steve was a regular guy with a knack for attracting odd situations. That day, the beach was buzzing with life. Kids building sand castles, adults basking in the sun, and teenagers playing volleyball. Steve found a perfect spot, laid out his towel, and headed for the refreshing embrace of the ocean. For the first hour, everything was perfect. The sun was warm, the water was cool, and Steve was floating on his back, letting the waves gently rock him. But just as he was about to head back to shore, the waves had other plans. In a series of mischievous swells, they snatched his swim trunks away. One moment, he was floating blissfully, and the next, he was as bare as a newborn. Steve's initial reaction was a mix of shock and denial. He frantically padded around himself, hoping to find his missing trunks floating nearby. Alas, they were gone, probably halfway to the Caribbean by now. Panic set in. The beach was packed, and Steve was in no mood to put on a show. He decided his best bet was to stay in the water, where at least the waves could offer some modesty. He began his awkward water dance, pretending to be a deep sea explorer, plunging down every few seconds to inspect something underwater. Meanwhile, he prayed that everyone on the beach would either look away or, even better, disappear altogether. Hours passed. The sun moved across the sky, transforming Steve into a human prune. The beach gradually emptied, but there was always someone left, lingering like an annoying pop-up ad. Steve wondered if he'd ever feel warmth again, or if he was destined to become a cautionary tale about the dangers of ocean pranks. Finally, the sun began to set, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink. The beach was almost deserted. Almost. Steve noticed there was only one person left. A woman sitting near the water, scribbling in a notebook. It was now or never. Mustering his courage, Steve spotted a drifting sand bucket and grabbed it. He held it strategically, using it as a makeshift shield of modesty. With the determination of a soldier heading into battle, he waded toward shore. His heart pounded as he neared the woman, hoping she wouldn't notice him, or if she did, that she'd be mercifully understanding. Just as Steve started to relax, thinking he'd pulled off the greatest escape since Houdini, he caught the woman's eye. She glanced at him, then at his sand bucket. Steve, emboldened by his near success, decided to strike up a conversation. Hey there. He said, 
Trying to sound casual while clutching his sand bucket for dear life, the woman looked up from her notebook, a twinkle in her eye. And what if I may ask, are you writing? I'm a psychologist, she said, observing the last remaining beach dwellers like a seagull eyeing a long lost French fry. Steve chuckled nervously. Well, you've got quite a subject in front of you. Care to read my mind? But this funny story ain't over just yet. The psychologist smiled, looking Steve up and down, then glancing pointedly at his trusty sand bucket. I think you thought that sand bucket has a bottom part. <laughs> now we bring you a boy that falls deeply in love just to get a terrible surprise from his father. In today's funny story joke, we've got a teenage romance so tangled, it makes a soap opera look like a simple sitcom. Picture a dad who thinks every crush is secretly related, a son whose love life is a sitcom plot, and a dating scene more complicated than your last tech problem. Get ready to laugh out loud as we untangle this hilariously mixed up love saga. Once upon a time in the cozy confines of suburban bliss, there was a family living a relatively uneventful life until the day young Danny burst into the living room his heart pounding with an enthusiasm that would put even the most animated tap dancer to shame. Dad, Dad, you won't believe it. I'm head over heels in love. Danny practically shouted, his eyes sparkling like fireworks. He practically danced around the living room, each step full of joy and maybe just a hint of clumsiness. His father, Mr. Thompson, looked up from his newspaper with a bemused smile. Oh, really, Danny? That's fantastic. Who's the lucky girl who's captured your heart? Danny's face glowed with a mixture of excitement and a sort of jittery nervousness. It's Emma. Mr. Thompson's eyes widened so much they could have been cartoon eyes. Emma? Emma, isn't she? Danny, who was practically vibrating with energy, eagerly interrupted. The neighbor's daughter. Yes. Isn't she amazing? I keep tripping over my own feet every time I see her. Mr. Thompson's face shifted from curiosity to alarm, his eyebrows shooting up as if he had just seen a ghost. Oh no, Danny, you can't date Emma. Danny's face fell, his smile wilting like a flower in the desert. Why not, Dad? Mr. Thompson took a deep breath and leaned in as if revealing top secret information. Well, son, Emma might be your sister. Danny's jaw dropped, his eyes as wide as saucers. What? But, Dad, we've known her for years. How could she be my sister? Mr. Thompson glanced around as if checking for eavesdroppers and whispered, Just don't tell your mother. Danny, disheartened and thoroughly confused, shuffled out of the room, his head hanging low. He trudged back to his room, wondering if maybe Cupid had lost his aim somewhere between the bow and arrow. Two weeks later, Danny's enthusiasm was undeterred. He bounded into the living room again, looking as though he had just discovered the meaning of life, or at least the next big thing in his romantic journey. Dad, guess what? Cupid struck again! Danny declared, eyes shimmering with the kind of innocent hope that only a teenager can muster. This time it's Jennifer. Mr. Thompson's face fell into a look of exaggerated dread. Jennifer. Oh no, Danny. I would stay away from her too. Danny's face went pale. Why, Dad, what's wrong with Jennifer? Mr. Thompson sighed heavily, as if the weight of the world were on his shoulders. She might also be your sister. Danny's shoulders slumped with a profound sense of defeat. Seriously, what are the odds? With a weary shake of his head, Danny trudged away, leaving his father to mutter under his breath. Maybe Cupid needs an optometrist. The days turned into weeks, and Danny's quest for love became a running joke in the household. Each new crush seemed to meet the same unfortunate fate. No matter who Danny fell for, his father always had the same grim prediction. She might be your sister, Mr. Thompson would say, 
with the same resigned tone as if he had prepared himself for the inevitable letdown. Danny began to question whether his father had some sort of secret family tree knowledge or if he was just playing an elaborate prank. The revolving door of potential romantic interests seemed to have a common denominator. They were all apparently related to him. Finally, Danny reached his limit. In a last-ditch effort to end this bizarre streak of familial faux pas, he decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart with his mother. He approached her with a serious look on his face, as though he were about to reveal the deepest of secrets. Mom, I need to talk to you, Danny said, taking a deep breath. I've been trying to find the love of my life, but every time I tell Dad about a new girl, he says she might be my sister. This is ridiculous. I'm starting to think I should carry a family tree flow chart on first dates. His mother, who was knitting in her favorite armchair, looked up with a knowing smile. Oh, Danny, she said soothingly. I understand. Your dad's been making this harder than it needs to be. Danny's eyes widened with hope. So you think he's wrong? His mother's smile broadened, and she leaned in as though sharing the most confidential of confidences. Actually, Danny, I wouldn't worry if I were you, because what your dad doesn't know is that he's not your real father either. <laughs> Ever wondered how it would be if your parents could be young again? Well, here is a story exactly about that. Ever wondered what would happen if you accidentally turned your parents into kids again? In today's funny story joke, get ready for a wild ride of youth elixirs, unexpected surprises, and a punchline that will leave you laughing. In the bustling heart of a small suburban town lived a young girl with a mind sharper than a surgeon's scalpel. She aced her final high school exams harder than a squirrel cracking a safe with a walnut. It was the kind of academic performance that would make the local news anchor fumble for words. She wasn't just smart, she was a genius. The kind of kid who made even the school's toughest teachers feel like they needed to hit the books again. Her parents, bless their cotton socks, cheered her on from the sidelines, proud as peacocks. But deep down, they were secretly hoarding ramen and praying that their retirement plan didn't involve them living at the zoo so she could attend the best university in America. The day her acceptance letter arrived was like Christmas in July. The parents did a happy dance in the kitchen, but as they read through the financial requirements, their smiles slowly melted away like ice cream on a hot day. Tuition, books, living expenses, it all added up faster than a caffeinated mathlete. But they were determined, and so, with a deep breath and a credit card that groaned in protest, they sent their daughter off to chase her dreams. Little did they know, the adventure was just beginning. Three years later, the family was still knee-deep in student loans, ramen, and prayer. The parents had become masters of budgeting, turning every penny into a dollar with their creative accounting. Just when they thought they couldn't tighten the belt any further, the phone rang. On the other end, their daughter's voice crackled with the kind of excitement that made you worry the neighbors might call the cops. Turns out, university wasn't just for overpriced ramen and existential dread. She'd aced her first degree. She was now officially smarter than the average bear, with a diploma to prove it. But with great power comes great responsibility, or in this case, a massive debt that could rival a small island nation's GDP. To repay the parental loan, it was guinea pig time. She had concocted a formula so groundbreaking, it made Einstein's theories look like child's play. Her invention? A youth elixir that promised to reverse aging faster than you could say bibs. One sip. She claimed, 
I and you'd be back in diapers quicker than a time machine on overdrive. Her parents, eyes twinkling with the kind of mischief usually reserved for kids sneaking cookies before dinner, accepted the challenge. But only drink one teaspoon per day, she warned, her voice stern as a drill sergeant. The parents, of course, nodded dutifully. But inside, they were already plotting their youthful escapades. Six months passed in a blur of homework, lab coats, and phone calls home. The daughter, now a rising star in the scientific community, finally found time to visit her parents. She walked through the front door, expecting the familiar sight of her aging, albeit still sprightly, parents. Instead, what she saw made her eyes bug out like a cartoon character who just saw their tax bill. Standing in the living room was a woman who looked like she had just welcomed herself to the dirty 20s, never mind the 30s. Her mother, who once had a few gray hairs and laugh lines, now sported a body that would make Shakira jealous and a laugh that could cure a hangover. Mom, what happened to you? You look fabulous, but where's dad? She stammered, her brain short-circuiting from the shock. Her mother, a sound that was now as youthful as her appearance. Well, that's the weirdest story. You see, the third night after he started drinking your formula, he got so sour that I was getting younger faster than him. He didn't like that one bit, so he downed the whole bottle of age to young in one go. Oh no, Mom. Where is Dad now? The daughter asked, her heart pounding with dread. The mother smiled, her eyes twinkling with a mix of love and exasperation as she turned to reveal the baby on her back. The bastard is on my back! Can you imagine the things you can still do when you are 85 years old? Hunting might not be one of them, or would it? What would you do if your 84-year-old dad called to say he's becoming a dad again? In today's funny story joke, we explore a wild tale of senior surprises, a confused son, and a doctor with an even crazier explanation. Get ready, this one's a doozy. There was a man named Frank. Frank prided himself on being a rational, no-nonsense kind of guy. He believed that every problem had a logical solution, and there was no mystery that couldn't be solved with a bit of common sense. But then, one day, Something happened that completely turned his world upside down. It all started when Frank received a phone call from his father, George, who was 84 years old and as spry as ever. George had always been a bit of a romantic, and even in his golden years, he hadn't lost his charm. A year ago, much to the surprise of everyone in town, George had met a beautiful young woman and married her in what seemed like the blink of an eye. Frank, my boy. George had said over the phone, I've got some news that'll knock your socks off. Frank, always expecting the unexpected from his father, braced himself. What is it, Dad? You're going to be a big brother. George announced, his voice brimming with excitement. Frank nearly dropped the phone. Dad, what? You're 84 years old. I know, I know. Isn't it amazing? George said, clearly thrilled. Frank, however, was anything but thrilled. As soon as he hung up, he started pacing back and forth in his living room, trying to make sense of it all. This can't be right, he muttered to himself. I mean, at his age? The more Frank thought about it, the more confused he became. Finally, he decided that this was beyond his understanding. He needed professional advice, so he made an appointment with Dr. Stevens, the town's trusted physician. Dr. Stevens was known not only for his medical expertise, but also for his eccentric way of explaining things. He had a knack for making even the most complicated medical issues seem simple. 
often using analogies and stories that left his patients both enlightened and entertained. Doctor, I need your advice on a rather unusual family matter, Frank said as he sat down in the doctor's office, his expression a mixture of disbelief and desperation. Go on, Frank, I'm listening, Dr. Stevens replied, leaning back in his chair with a thoughtful look on his face. Frank took a deep breath. It's about my dad. He's 84 years old, and last year he married a much younger woman. And now, well, now she's pregnant. Dr. Stevens raised an eyebrow but didn't say a word, letting Frank continue. I mean, is that even possible at his age? Could he really be the father? I just don't understand how... Frank trailed off, shaking his head. Dr. Stevens nodded slowly, clearly considering his response. Frank, let me tell you a little story that might help clarify things. Frank leaned in, curious despite himself. He knew that when Dr. Stevens started telling a story, it was always worth listening to. You see, Frank, my family has always been big on hunting. Every year, we go on a hunting trip together, and my own father, who's about the same age as yours, still comes along. He's a stubborn old man, much like your dad, and he insists on doing everything himself. Frank nodded, intrigued. Well, last year, when we went on our annual hunting trip, something rather peculiar happened. My father was so excited about the trip that in his haste, he accidentally packed his walking cane in his rifle bag instead of his rifle. None of us realized this until we were deep in the woods, ready to start the hunt. Frank couldn't help but smile at the thought of an old man eagerly preparing for a hunt, only to end up with a walking cane instead of a rifle. Dr. Stevens continued. The next morning, we spotted a magnificent trophy deer. It was a beautiful creature, standing there as if it was posing just for us. Everyone got excited, and we all shouted, Grandpa, shoot it, shoot it! My father, determined as ever, stood up in the back of the pickup truck, unzipped his rifle bag, and pulled out his walking cane. Frank chuckled, already imagining where this story was headed. But here's the strangest part, Dr. Stevens said, his eyes twinkling with amusement. My father, with all the confidence in the world, aimed that walking cane at the deer, said bang, and I'm not kidding, the deer fell over dead, bullet hole and all. Frank stared at Dr. Stevens in disbelief. That's impossible. Someone else must have shot the deer. Dr. Stevens leaned back, nodding slowly as a sly smile spread across his face. Now, Frank, that's exactly my point. Here is a funny story about how different surgeons experience different patients. In today's uproariously funny story joke, we take you to the zany and side-splitting world of St. Suture's Hospital. Imagine five of the most brilliant surgeons, known as much for their razor-sharp wit as for their surgical skills, gathered in the bustling cafeteria during their lunch break. It's a place where life-saving meets laugh-inducing, and today's discussion is no exception. As per their hilarious tradition, the conversation swiftly morphs into a playful and riotous debate about the quirkiest and most amusing types of patients to operate on. Get ready for a comedy of surgical proportions where scalpels meet punchlines and laughter is the best medicine. The first surgeon, Dr. Anderson, known for his meticulous nature, leaned forward with a confident smile. Accountants, my friends, are the best to operate on. Why? Because when you open them up, everything on the inside is numbered. It's like performing surgery in a perfectly organized spreadsheet. He emphasized his point by mimicking the opening of an imaginary Excel file. The other surgeons laughed, envisioning neat rows and columns of organs and arteries. Dr. Bradley, the second surgeon, who had a reputation for enjoying a good challenge, chuckled and countered, You haven't seen anything until you've operated on a librarian. 
Everything inside them is meticulously arranged in alphabetical order. It's like navigating a well-indexed library in there. He grinned, imagining little Dewey decimal codes on each organ. The group couldn't help but laugh at the thought. Not to be outdone, Dr. Caldwell, the third surgeon, chimed in. Ah, but have you ever worked on an electrician? Now there's a treat. Everything inside them is color-coded, like working with a rainbow of wires. It's almost too easy. The surgeons burst into laughter, picturing a body filled with brightly colored electrical cables, each one perfectly labeled. Dr. Dexter, the fourth surgeon, known for his sharp wit, leaned back with a mischievous grin. I beg to differ. Lawyers are the most fascinating patients. They're heartless, spineless, gutless, and their heads and butts are completely interchangeable. The group erupted into laughter at the mental image. He paused for effect, letting the chuckles die down before delivering his punchline. Plus, operating on them is great practice for arguing a case in court. As the laughter subsided, Dr. Evans, the fifth surgeon, who had been quietly listening to the conversation, finally spoke up. He was known for his methodical approach to both surgery and life. Well, gentlemen, he began, a twinkle in his eye. While all those choices certainly have their merits, I have to say I prefer engineers. But before Dr. Evans could continue, a sudden announcement interrupted the room. Attention, Attention all, all surgeons, surgeons code, code blue, blue in OR3. OR Immediate, Immediate assistance, assistance required. required. The cafeteria fell silent as the five surgeons exchanged quick, serious glances. Without a word, they bolted from the cafeteria, sprinting down the hallways towards the operating room. Their light-hearted banter was replaced by the adrenaline-fueled urgency of the emergency. Arriving at OR3, they found a young intern struggling to stabilize a patient on the operating table. Dr. Anderson immediately took charge, barking orders while the others fell into their practiced roles with military precision. Dr. Bradley prepped the patient while Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Dexter assisted Dr. Anderson. Dr. Evans monitored the vitals, ensuring everything stayed within safe parameters. It was a chaotic scene, but the surgeons worked in perfect harmony, their earlier camaraderie now a driving force in saving the patient's life. Minutes felt like hours, but finally, the crisis was averted. The patient stabilized, and the room exhaled a collective sigh of relief. The surgeons exchanged weary smiles, their bond strengthened by the shared experience. As they made their way back to the cafeteria, Dr. Evans picked up where he left off. So, as I was saying before, we were so dramatically interrupted, he said with a grin. I prefer engineers. And why is that? Dr. Anderson asked. Dr. Evans continued with a chuckle. You see, they always understand when you have a few parts left over at the end. It's like they anticipate the need for spare parts. Mother-in-laws are normally not the favorite person. But what if she is very wealthy and want to test her son-in-law? In today's funny story joke, Get ready for a side-splitting adventure that's more twisted than a soap opera and funnier than a slapstick comedy. Imagine a mother-in-law with a cunning regime to test her sons-in-law in the most ludicrous way possible. Intrigued? Prepare for a whirlwind of hilarity that will have you laughing out loud and on the edge of your seat until the very last punchline. Once upon a time, in a quaint little town lived a mother with three daughters. This wasn't just any mother, though. She was a force of nature, ruling the household with an iron will and an eagle eye. Not to mention she had a knack for balancing precariously on her husband's head, both figuratively and sometimes literally. Yes, the mother-in-law was the ultimate authority, the embodiment of control 
And if arrogance were a currency, she'd have outbid Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk combined. Now, these daughters were every man's dream wives, charming, intelligent, and kind-hearted. It was almost hard to believe they were raised by the Queen of Smug. However, their mother's overbearing nature made her somewhat, well, unlikable. This led to a burning question in the mother-in-law's mind. Did her sons-in-law care enough about her to save her life if push came to shove? Armed with this burning question, the mother-in-law devised a cunning plan. She would pretend to fall into the river and see which of her sons-in-law would jump in to save her. The results, she thought, would be both enlightening and entertaining. The mother-in-law took her first son-in-law, Bob, for a stroll by the river. As they walked along the picturesque path, the mother-in-law executed her plan, falling into the water with all the grace of a drunken flamingo. Help! She cried, flailing her arms like a mother-in-law on overdrive. Bob, without a second thought, leaped into the river, splashing like a man on a mission. He dragged her to safety, puffing and panting but proud of his heroic deed. The next morning, Bob woke up to find the keys to a brand new Ferrari and a check for $5 million on his doorstep. The note read, Thank you for saving my life, your grateful mother-in-law. Next, the mother-in-law tested her second son-in-law, Steve. They took the same walk by the river, and the mother-in-law performed her signature dive into the water. Help! Help! She screamed, thrashing about like a fish on land. Steve, channeling his inner Baywatch, dove in after her and pulled her to shore, earning himself a few scrapes and bruises in the process. The following morning, Steve found a Ferrari and a $5 million check waiting for him with the same heartfelt note. Thank you for saving my life, your grateful mother-in-law. Finally, the mother-in-law took her third son-in-law, Carl, for the infamous river walk. As she launched herself into the water, flailing dramatically, Carl stood by the riverbank with a serene smother-in-law on his face. Help! she yelled, performing an impressive array of splashy maneuvers. Carl simply watched as she sputtered and splashed. After a few moments, he walked away, whistling a merry tune. But, but just as you thought the story was winding down, the twist hits you like a punchline to the gut. Hey, hey, but this comedy isn't over just yet. Brace yourself, because the true finale is about to unfold in a way you never saw coming. The next day, Carl found an envelope waiting for him. Inside were the keys to a brand new Rolls Royce and a check for $10 million. The note read, Thank you for saving my life, your grateful father-in-law. <laughs> Husbands and wives will play pranks on one another from time to time, but who is the ultimate winner? Well, see for yourself. Get ready for a funny story joke where a simple shopping trip spirals into a comedic battle of wits between husband and wife. This isn't just about shopping bags, it's about life's little marital showdowns. With each twist, you'll find hilarious lessons in love, respect, and the art of outsmarting your spouse. So grab some popcorn, settle in, and enjoy this uproarious tale that's as funny as it is insightful. It was a sunny Saturday afternoon, and Emily was all set for her weekend shopping spree. Her husband Tom, however, had other plans. The big football match was on, and nothing in the world could tear him away from the TV. As she grabbed her purse and headed for the door, she called out, Tom, aren't you coming with me? 
Tom, eyes glued to the screen, barely registered her voice. Now you go ahead. It's kickoff time. Emily paused, a mischievous grin creeping across her face. All right, then, she said, but under her breath, she added, I'll make sure you won't enjoy that match either. Arriving at the store, Emily strolled through the aisles, picking up everything from new shoes to a blender she'd been eyeing for weeks. As she reached the cash counter, she opened her purse to pay. The cashier, a young man with a keen eye for detail, noticed something unusual. Among the usual items in her purse, a wallet, some makeup, and a couple of receipts, was a TV remote. Excuse me, ma'am, the cashier said, barely suppressing a smile. Do you always carry your TV remote with you? Emily chuckled, shaking her head. Not always, but today's a special day. You see, my husband refused to come shopping with me because of a football match. So I brought the remote with me. If I can't have his company, he can't have his football. The cashier burst into <laughs> laughter, clearly entertained by Emily's ingenuity. Moral of the story, she said with a wink, Accompany and support your wife and her hobbies. As the cashier continued scanning items, Emily felt a surge of satisfaction. She was about to win this round. But then, something unexpected happened. The cashier stopped, her smile fading, and began returning the items back to the cart. Emily's heart skipped a beat. What are you doing? She asked, confusion etched on her face. The cashier looked up apologetically. I'm sorry, ma'am, but it seems your husband has blocked your credit card. Emily's jaw dropped. Tom had outsmarted her. Moral of the story. The cashier added with a sympathetic smile. Always respect the hobbies of your husband. But Emily wasn't done yet. With a sly smile, she reached back into her purse and pulled out Tom's credit card. Let's try this one, she said confidently. The cashier hesitated for a moment, but then swiped the card. For a split second, everything seemed to be back on track. But then, the machine beeped, flashing a message that read, Enter the pin sent to your mobile phone. Emily's confidence wavered, but only for a moment. She had anticipated this. Reaching once again into her purse, she pulled out Tom's phone, which she had thoughtfully taken along with the remote. The forwarded SMS with the pin popped up on the screen. Moral of the story, Emily said with a triumphant grin. Don't underestimate the power and wisdom of your wife. The transaction finally completed, and Emily felt victorious. She had outwitted Tom at his own game. But as she arrived home, her triumph was short-lived. There, on the front door, was a note from Tom. Couldn't find the remote gone out with the boys to watch the match. The key is with me. Call me on my phone if you need anything. <laughs> it will be irresponsible of us to have a compilation of funny stories without giving little Johnny a chance to shine. Here goes. In today's funny story joke, get ready for a classroom comedy caper, starring the one and only Little Johnny. This tale promises a blend of comedy, wit, and unexpected twists that will leave you laughing out loud. Our story begins with Mrs. Smith, a teacher with a flair for the quirky and humorous. Known for her funny questions and lighthearted approach, she turns an ordinary classroom quiz into an unforgettable joke-filled adventure. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this funny story. In the small, charming town of Evergreen, there was a school where humor and curiosity often collided in delightful ways. Mrs. Smith, a teacher known for her unique approach to education, had a penchant for asking quirky questions during her weekly quiz sessions. Her classroom was a place where the ordinary turned extraordinary, and today was no exception. 
As the sun streamed through the windows of room 5B, Mrs. Smith decided it was time for her favorite part of the day, the quirky quiz session. She smiled mischievously as she scanned the room, her eyes settling on little Johnny, the class clown. Johnny was known for his lightning-fast wit and mischievous nature, always ready with a clever retort or a cheeky grin. All right, class, it's time for our quiz. Mrs. Smith announced, her voice brimming with enthusiasm. Today, I have a particularly interesting question for you all. The students leaned forward, intrigued. Little Johnny, sitting at the back of the class, smirked, ready for whatever was coming his way. Mrs. Smith's eyes twinkled as she asked, Who stole the pears from the tree in my garden? A hush fell over the classroom, eyes darted to little Johnny, who was notorious for his pranks. Mrs. Smith, suspecting Johnny, pointed directly at him. Johnny, do you know what happened to the pears in my garden? Johnny, ever the quick thinker, responded with a straight face. Ma'am, can you please speak up? I can't hear you from the back of the class. Mrs. Smith, unimpressed but undeterred, repeated the question louder. Johnny, do you know what happened to the pears in my garden? Once again, Johnny feigned innocence. Ma'am, I still can't hear you from back here. The class giggled softly, anticipating the unfolding drama. Mrs. Smith, sensing Johnny's game, decided to turn the tables. All right, Johnny, let's switch places. You come to the front and I'll sit in your seat at the back. Then you can ask me a question and we'll see if I can hear you. Johnny, seeing no way out, reluctantly made his way to the front of the class. Mrs. Smith took his seat at the back folding her arms and giving him an expectant look. Johnny, now standing at the front, surveyed the room, his mind racing. He needed to come up with something quick. Suddenly, a mischievous idea popped into his head. He cleared his throat and with a straight face asked, When my mommy was away last weekend visiting Granny, a lady visited my daddy and made love to him. Do you know who that lady was? But this funny story joke ain't over just yet. The room fell into an almost eerie silence. The students' eyes widened, and Mrs. Smith's face turned a shade of crimson. She was caught off guard, but managed to compose herself quickly. Johnny, this time you're right. I can't hear anything from back here. Ever wondered what an old man's deathbed desire will be? Well, here is one for the books. In today's funny story joke, we delve into the life of a man named Henry, whose final words have been hailed as one of the most uproarious jokes of all time. Brace yourself for a tale that combines love, laughter, and a perfectly timed punchline that will leave you laughing for eternity. Get ready to meet Henry, a man who turned the art of humor into a legacy and gave his town something to laugh about for generations. In a small, picturesque town, there lived a man named Henry and his notoriously difficult wife, Mary. Henry, a man with an infamous sense of humor, had endured Mary's sharp tongue and selfish nature for years. Everyone in town knew Mary for her high-pitched nagging and endless demands, while Henry was known for his resilience and his ability to find humor in the most challenging situations. Henry's life had been one of quiet endurance and subtle jokes. He had learned early on that the best way to cope with Mary's constant complaints and unreasonable demands was to laugh. He was the kind of man who could find a silver lining in the darkest clouds, and he had become something of a local legend for his ability to turn even the most aggravating circumstances into a punchline. As fate would have it, Henry fell gravely ill. His once vibrant and playful spirit was now confined to a bed 
in their modest home. The illness had taken a toll on him, but his sense of humor remained intact. He often thought about the best way to leave a final mark on the world. One last joke that would make everyone remember him fondly. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a golden glow through the bedroom window, Mary barged into the room. Her face was set in a permanent scowl, and she carried a cup of tea which she unceremoniously plunked on the bedside table. Here's your tea, Henry. Drink it while it's hot, and don't spill it on the sheets again, you hear? She barked, her voice cutting through the peaceful evening like a rusty saw. Henry looked up at her, a weak smile playing on his lips. Thank you, Mary. Can you sit with me for a moment? I have something important to discuss with you. Mary sighed dramatically, rolling her eyes. All right, but make it quick. I've got things to do. She snapped, tapping her foot impatiently. Henry chuckled softly, a sound that seemed to irritate Mary even more. Of course, my dear, it won't take long. What is it? Henry! Henry took a deep breath, his frail hand reaching for hers. Mary, I've been thinking about what will happen after I'm gone. I want to make sure you're taken care of. Mary's eyes widened slightly, surprised by his concern. It was so unlike Henry to be serious. Oh, Henry, that's considerate of you, she said, her voice softening for the briefest of moments. Henry's smile widened, and a twinkle of mischief appeared in his eyes. Yes, well, it's important. I have one last request, Mary. Promise me if I die, you will marry Charlie. Mary's face twisted in confusion. Charlie, your best friend, but you hate him, she exclaimed, her voice rising in pitch. Henry's eyes sparkled with mischief as he looked into Mary's eyes. That's why I want him to suffer. <laughs> we believe the following funny story is one of our best. It involves the Mafia and a Godfather. In today's funny story joke, we enter the world of organized crime, where trust is fragile and secrets are buried deep. Our tale features a powerful godfather, his deaf accountant, and a clever lawyer who's always one step ahead. With millions on the line and lives at stake, get ready for a hilarious twist that'll keep you laughing until the very last word. In the heart of the city, where the shadows whispered secrets and the streets echoed with the silent footsteps of men who dealt in things best left unspoken, there was a man they called the Godfather. He wasn't just any man, he was the man. The kind of guy who, when he entered a room, you felt the temperature drop a few degrees and your spine got a little less confident. His empire was vast, his influence immeasurable, and his methods, well, let's just say, you didn't want to end up on his bad side. Now, the Godfather was no fool. He knew that in his line of work, trust was more precious than gold, and he wasn't about to trust just anyone with his money. That's why he hired a deaf accountant. This guy was perfect. He could crunch numbers like a human calculator, but couldn't hear a word of the shady dealings that went on around him. It was the Godfather's foolproof plan. If the cops ever came knocking, there wouldn't be a single word of testimony to spill. But the Godfather, always thinking ahead, kept a lawyer on retainer. This wasn't your average lawyer. This was a lawyer who knew how to toe the line between legality and illegality so finely that he could walk it in his sleep. And, as an added bonus, the lawyer knew sign language. This was essential because, as you might guess, the Godfather didn't speak a lick of it. One day, the Godfather was doing what Godfathers do, 
checking his accounts and making sure everything was running as smoothly as a well-oiled machine. But something wasn't right. There it was, staring back at him from the ledger. Ten million dollars, gone, vanished. The blood drained from his face, but his eyes narrowed like a hawk spotting a mouse. There was only one person who could have pulled off a heist like this under his nose, the deaf accountant. Without wasting a second, the godfather grabbed his lawyer by the collar and said, Let's go pay the money man a visit. Today's the day he'll be singing an opera, and I'll be the conductor. They arrived at the accountant's house with all the subtlety of a bull in a china shop. The accountant, already a nervous wreck from the perpetual pressure of working for the most feared man in the city, nearly fainted when he saw who had darkened his doorstep. The godfather didn't waste any time. He pulled out his gun, a sleek piece of metal that looked more like a shark ready to devour its prey than a simple weapon. He leveled it at the accountant and said to the lawyer, Ask this numbers guy to sing a song about 10 million bucks, or I'll start conducting in a way he won't like. The lawyer, sweating bullets despite his practiced calm, turned to the accountant and began signing furiously. The Godfather wants to know where his $10 million are. If you don't tell him, you'll be pushing up daisies by sunset. The accountant's face turned ashen. He knew the game was up. There was no point in lying. With trembling hands, he signed back. I swear the money is safe. It's in a brown suitcase, buried behind my house, underneath the oak tree. Please, just don't hurt me. The lawyer watched the accountant's frantic gestures, understanding perfectly what was being communicated. He nodded solemnly, then turned back to the godfather, who was staring at him with an intensity that could melt steel. So? The godfather said, his voice low and menacing. What did the choir boy say? Spill it before I decide to rearrange his vocal cords permanently. The lawyer, whose mind was now racing at lightning speed, saw an opportunity that was as risky as it was tempting. He dropped his arms to his sides, feigning disappointment. His voice was steady, but there was a subtle tremor that only the keenest ears could detect. Godfather, he said, this pig doesn't have the guts to shoot. Ever wondered what will happen if a blonde goes undercover and change her hair color? Well, here is the result. In today's cartoon story joke, we've got a comedy so uproarious, it'll have you L-O-ling. Watch as a blonde with a bold new look takes on a cow-filled traffic jam and a crafty farmer, proving that laughter and adventure go hand in hand. Once upon a time, in a small town not too far from the bustling city, there lived a blonde woman named Lisa. Lisa was well acquainted with the barrage of blonde jokes that seemed to follow her wherever she went. She had heard them all. The light bulb jokes, the why did the blonde stare at the orange juice, gags, you name it. It was as if her hair color was the punchline to every joke in the book. Lisa, being a spirited and determined woman, finally reached her breaking point. She was done with being the butt of everyone's jokes. It wasn't just about a fresh look anymore. It was about reclaiming her identity and proving she was more than the stereotype. So, in a move that could only be described as a bold, rebellious statement, she decided to dye her hair black. This was not a mere change in hue. It was her declaration of independence from the relentless jabs and jests. Feeling like a brand new person with her chic brunette locks, Lisa decided to take her transformation on the road. She was itching to show off her new look and make a fresh start. And what better way to do that than with a cross-country road trip? Her destination, Montana, to visit her sister, 
and experience the wide open spaces and rugged charm of the Wild West. So, off she went, cruising through the scenic Montana landscapes with the wind in her hair. Well, technically, her newly dyed black hair. The open road stretched before her, and she was ready to embrace her new beginning. But as fate would have it, her grand adventure hit an unexpected snag. As Lisa drove through a particularly picturesque stretch of Montana, she suddenly found herself stuck in the midst of a colossal traffic jam. And not just any traffic jam. This was a herd of cows so large, it looked like the Great Wall of China had decided to take a nap right in the middle of the road. The cows were leisurely strolling, munching grass, and generally causing mayhem. It seemed like there was no way around them. At the center of this bovine blockade was a rugged farmer who looked like he had stepped straight out of a coveralls weekly magazine. He was trying his best to herd the cows, but it was clear he had his work cut out for him. Lisa, however, wasn't about to let a herd of cows, or the prospect of being stuck in traffic, dampen her spirits. Channeling her newfound brunette confidence, she marched right up to the farmer. If I can guess how many cows are in this herd, can I have one? Lisa said, her voice brimming with determination. The farmer, who was no doubt thinking that this was either an absurd joke or a feat as likely as winning the lottery, gave her a skeptical look. But he had a sense of humor and a taste for a good laugh. Shoot, darling, he said with a grin. Knock yourself out. Lisa took a deep breath, squinted her eyes, and made her best guess. She was spot on, nailing the exact number of cows in the herd. The farmer's jaw dropped in disbelief. He had seen a lot of things in his life, but this was something else entirely. True to his word, he said. Well, I'll be damned. All right, pick your cow. With a sense of triumph and a twinkle in her eye, Lisa began to survey the herd like a seasoned ranch ham. After a few moments of careful observation, she selected the smallest cow, a little runt that seemed to fit perfectly with her new lifestyle. She managed to load the petite cow into her car with surprising ease, her confidence and determination making the task seem like a breeze. Just as Lisa was about to drive off with her new bovine companion, the farmer called out to her, his voice full of mischief. Hold your horses, honey, he said, grinning from ear to ear. Before you ride off into the sunset, I've got a proposition for you. If I can guess your real hair color, can I have my dog back? Do you want to know the secret to a long and happy marriage? Well, here is one couple's story. In today's cartoon story joke, we plunge headfirst into a rib-tickling and adventurous odyssey brimming with improbable antics and a splash of matrimonial mirth. Imagine this, a couple, renowned far and wide for their 25 years of unblemished wedded harmony without a single quarrel, becomes the chatter of the township. The local newspaper editors, utterly flabbergasted and eager to uncover their arcane secret, summon them for an exclusive tete-a-tete. Little do they know, they're about to unravel a narrative that kicks off with a horseback riding honeymoon and culminates in a climactic flourish. Quite literally. Gird your loins as we trot through the ludicrous escapades of Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins, a couple who illustrate that occasionally. A hearty laugh and a wild romp are all one needs to maintain tranquility. In a quiet town known for its picturesque scenery and friendly neighbors, a married couple had achieved a feat that seemed impossible to the rest of the world. 25 years of wedded bliss without a single argument. Their remarkable story had spread far and wide, 
And soon, even the local newspaper editors were intrigued. Baffled and curious, they decided to uncover the secret to this extraordinary marital harmony. The couple, Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins, were invited to the newspaper office for an exclusive interview. The room was buzzing with excitement as the editors prepared their questions. When the couple arrived, they were greeted with wide-eyed wonder and an eagerness to learn their secret. Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins, began the chief editor, how on earth did you manage such an impossible feat? 25 years without a single argument is unheard of. Mr. Jenkins, a jovial man with a twinkle in his eye, leaned in and began to recount their honeymoon tale. Huh. Well, you see, he said, it all started with a horseback riding adventure. We were on our honeymoon in the beautiful countryside, and I was lucky to be paired with a gentle, well-behaved steed. But my dear wife, oh, she was saddled with a wild, untamed beast. He paused for dramatic effect, the editors hanging on his every word. As we trotted along, her horse decided to channel its inner rodeo star, sending my wife flying through the air not once, not twice, but thrice. The room burst into laughter. Mr. Jenkins continued, his eyes wide with the memory. Now most spouses might have erupted into a fiery argument after such a calamity, but not my wife. Oh no, she dusted herself off, patted the unruly creature on the back, and said, this is your first time. The editors chuckled, but Mr. Jenkins wasn't finished. As you can imagine, the horse didn't quite get the memo and repeated its antics not once, but twice more. By this point, I was in shock, watching my beloved wife handle the situation with the calm demeanor of a seasoned cowboy. But then, he added with a chuckle, came the moment that left me speechless. As the horse reared up for its third encore performance, my wife calmly reached for her revolver and bang, the horse met its demise. Oh no, this funny story joke ain't over just yet. The editors gasped in disbelief, their eyes wide with astonishment. Mr. Jenkins's jaw practically hit the floor. I couldn't contain my shock, he confessed. What on earth are you doing, I exclaimed. And do you know what she said? The room fell silent, hanging on the punchline. With a mischievous grin, Mr. Jenkins delivered the final blow. She looked me dead in the eye and said, Well, darling, this is your first time. <laughs> Ever had a hangover? How do your wife treat you the next day after a hard night out with the boys? Well, what if everything is perfectly normal the next morning? In today's funny story joke, we dive headfirst into the chaotic life of Dave, an ordinary husband who manages to turn a night of drunken antics into an unexpected triumph. Ever had one of those mornings where you wake up with a hilariously hangover so massive, you're convinced your entire life has turned upside down? Dave certainly has. Strap in and hold on to your coffee, because this hilarious tale of confusion comedy and accidental heroism is about to take you on a laugh out loud journey meet dave an average guy with an above average appetite for beers on friday nights last night was no exception he and his buddies hit every pub in town starting with the tipsy turtle and ending at the drunken dragon a bar so sketchy even the roaches carry pepper spray they laughed told tall tales, and attempted to sing karaoke, much to the horror of everyone within earshot. Dave, naturally, was the life of the party, convincing everyone that ordering another round was always a good idea. Fast forward to the next morning. Dave wakes up feeling like he's been run over by a stampede of wild elephants. He attempts to open his eyes, 
but they feel glued shut. When he finally manages to crack them open, the first thing he notices is the pounding in his head, like a drummer practicing for a heavy metal band right inside his skull. Every beat of his heart sends shockwaves through his brain, and he wonders if he somehow managed to swallow a jackhammer last night. The room is spinning, and he can't tell if it's because he's still drunk or if his bed is now located on a merry-go-round. Groaning, he tries to piece together the previous night. Bits and pieces come back to him in flashes, dancing on the bar, attempting to ride a mechanical bull, and challenging a stranger to an arm wrestling match, which he lost spectacularly. Each memory brings a fresh wave of embarrassment and another throb in his head. He rolls over and notices something strange on his bedside table, and that's when things start to get really interesting. He sees a couple of aspirin and a glass of water on the bedside table. This is strange. Usually, after a night like this, he's greeted by his wife's icy silence and a list of chores long enough to make Hercules weep. Instead, someone has thoughtfully placed a hangover kit by his side. He looks around the room, and everything is in perfect order. His clothes for the day are neatly placed at the foot of the bed, looking crisp and ironed. Now, this is definitely weird. Either he's woken up in an alternate universe, or he's still dreaming. Tentatively, he gets out of bed, trying to piece together the fragments of last night. As he stumbles towards the kitchen, he finds a note on the table from his wife. Honey, breakfast is on the table. I left early for grocery shopping. Love you. Oh no, I must have died. Dave thinks. This can't be real. In his groggy state, he's convinced that this is some kind of afterlife where hangovers are taken seriously and treated with kindness. He shuffles into the kitchen, and sure enough, there's a hot breakfast and a newspaper waiting for him. He pinches himself. Nope, not a dream. But something is very, very wrong. His previous world did not treat men like this after a heavy night out with the boys. His son, Timmy, is already up, munching on his cereal. Dave decides to probe for information. Hey, buddy, what happened last night? He asks, trying to sound casual. You came home around 3 a.m. drunk as a skunk. Timmy replies without looking up from his cereal. You broke some plates, peed in the hall, and stumbled into the door. Classic. Okay, now that sounds more like it. Dave nods, relieved that at least some things haven't changed. But it still doesn't explain the bizarre hospitality he's receiving. He decides to dig deeper. So why is everything in order? I was expecting a big fight with your mom. Dave says, bracing himself for the explanation. But this funny story joke ain't over just yet. Timmy finally looks up, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Oh, that part was hilarious. Mom dragged you to the bedroom, and when she tried to take off your clothes and shoes, you yelled, Lady, leave me alone. I'm married, and I love my wife. <laughs> Do you ever get too old for a game of golf? Well... What if you spend more time in the bushes than on the fairways? Perhaps there is a solution. In today's funny story joke, get ready for a hilarious adventure that will tickle your funny bone and have you rolling with laughter. We're diving into a comedic tale that proves the only thing worse than bad eyesight is a golf game that turns into a full-blown comedy of errors. Meet Jeremy, a golf enthusiast whose love for the game was only rivaled by his frustration over his deteriorating vision. Jeremy had the eyesight of a bat with a blindfold. If you put a golf ball in front of him, he'd probably mistake it for a misplaced rock. One day, after yet another grueling round of searching for his missing ball, 
Jeremy came home looking defeated. His wife, ever the problem solver, noticed his glum expression and asked, What's wrong, darling? Did you lose your ball in the bushes again? Jeremy groaned. It's worse than that. I'm not even sure if the ball makes it to the right hole. It just seems to vanish into thin air. Seeing her husband's despair, his wife had a sudden brainwave. I've got a plan. My 85-year-old brother has eyesight that rivals a hawk's. He'll be your golf ball spotting hero. Jeremy, skeptical but willing to try anything, agreed. The next morning, he and his brother-in-law set off for the golf course. Jeremy was hopeful that this new set of eyes would finally solve his golfing woes. His brother-in-law was ready to be the ultimate spotter, tracking the ball with precision. At the first tee, Jeremy lined up for his shot, feeling a bit of renewed optimism. He took a mighty swing, and the ball soared into the sky. Jeremy was filled with confidence as he turned to his brother-in-law. So, did you see where the ball landed? Oh, yes. The brother-in-law replied enthusiastically. I saw exactly where you hit the ball, but now I can't remember. Jeremy's face fell. You saw where I hit it, but you can't remember where it landed. The brother-in-law nodded apologetically. Yes. It's a bit like trying to remember where you parked your car in a huge parking lot. You know you saw it, but the exact location escapes you. Jeremy stared in disbelief. I thought you were supposed to have eyes like a hawk. Well, said his brother-in-law with a wink. Even hawks have their off days. Besides, the real challenge is not just finding the ball, but finding humor in the search. Jeremy couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. So, what's next? Are we going to play hide-and-seek with my golf ball? His brother-in-law chuckled. Might as well. At least it's a game we're both good at. And so, the day turned into an unplanned adventure in golf ball hide-and-seek. Jeremy and his brother-in-law spent more time laughing and searching than actually playing golf. By the end of the day, they had lost track of not just the golf ball, but also the score. As they rode back in the golf cart, Jeremy turned to his brother-in-law. You know, this might just be the best round of golf I've ever had. His brother-in-law smiled. Well, at least you had a great time, even if we never found that ball. So, when Jeremy and his brother-in-law got back to the clubhouse, Jeremy said with a grin, So, tell me we both are terrible at golf. My wife makes me play golf because she thinks it is good exercise. And you? Well, I play because it annoys my wife. She thinks I am having fun. <laughs> Our last funny story of the day is about a blonde air host. We would like to thank you so much for spending the time to watch our funny story compilation. If you enjoyed it, then please subscribe to our channel and have a look at some of our other compilations. Here goes. In today's funny story joke, we dive into the world of comedy with a hilarious tale of a new blonde flight attendant on his first overnight trip. This funny incident blends the best elements of storytelling and jokes to deliver pure comedic gold. Join us as we unravel a comedy of errors where confusion meets hilarity and one rookie's mishap turns into a legendary tale among his crew. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this funny story joke guaranteed to bring a smile to your face. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when Captain Jake Anderson welcomed his newest recruit, Sam, a fresh-faced blonde flight attendant with the enthusiasm of a Labrador puppy, into the bustling world of commercial aviation. Sam practically radiated excitement, like a human energy drink with wings. Now, Captain Anderson was no stranger to the skies, He'd flown through thunderstorms, navigated Bermuda Triangle turbulence, and once even outwitted a rogue seagull dead set on stealing his in-flight peanuts. But mentoring Sam? That was a whole new altitude. 
Their first overnight trip together took them to a charming city known for its vibrant culture and welcoming locals. Captain Anderson decided to give Sam the grand tour. They strolled through lively streets, the captain pointing out the best places for airline personnel to eat, shop, and stay overnight. Sam listened attentively, nodding as if he were committing every detail to memory. At a quaint bistro, they sat down for a meal. Sam ordered a salad, and Captain Anderson, a man who believed in hearty aviation-sized portions, went for the triple-decker burger. Over coffee, Captain Anderson shared war stories from his flying days. Once, he said, leaning in conspiratorially, I had to land blindfolded because the cockpit cup holder malfunctioned. Sam's eyes widened. Really? No, Captain Anderson chuckled. But it got your attention, didn't it? Next, they explored hidden gems, the kind of places tourists never found. They discovered an underground jazz club where the saxophonist moonlighted as an air traffic controller. The music was so smooth that even turbulence would have tapped its foot. As evening settled in, they reached their hotel, a cozy establishment with a lobby that screamed, welcome weary travelers. Plush sofas beckoned and a fireplace crackled, casting shadows on the walls. Captain Anderson pointed out the key features, the elevator, which occasionally sang elevator music, the ice machine, which had a PhD in cubology, and the vending machine, which dispensed wisdom along with Snickers bars. Hold on to your hotel key cards, because this funny story joke isn't over just yet. Get a good night's sleep, Sam, Captain Anderson advised, his warm smile reassuring. We have an early start tomorrow. But the next morning, at the crew briefing, Captain Anderson realized something was amiss. Sam was missing. Panic fluttered in the captain's chest. He dialed Sam's room number. Sam, where are you? We need to start the briefing. I, I can't get out of my room. Sam's voice crackled through the phone. Captain Anderson frowned. You can't get out? Why not? There are only three doors in here. Sam groaned. One leads to the bathroom, one to the closet, and one has a sign that says, Do not disturb. Sam, that last one is the emergency exit. Take that one. <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.